For criminal media's policy, I'm Sane Zamini. Authors Matthew Blackman and Nick Doll joins me to discuss their book titled Rose Gallery, An Irreverent History of Corruption in South Africa from the VOC to the ANC. So Matthew, this book reminds us that our country has never been free of corruption and people who abuse power for personal gain. Can you tell us how the idea of this book came about? Nick and I were looking for an idea to write a book together and we couldn't really think of, of a topic initially. And one of the issues that, that we regularly encountered in our lives was people saying Azuma and the ANC um, are a unique kind of experience to South African history. It was never like this before. Corruption only kind of existed with the ANC. They brought it in and you know, I mean, both Nick and I had had read enough South African history to know that that simply wasn't true. So eventually, we suddenly realized that this was a, a good topic for a book. At the time, Nick had done a story on Willem Adrian van der Stel, and I'd been doing a lot of reading and writing around um, Oliver Schreiner, Sol Pleike, and their relationship with, with Rhodes. And, you know, I kept on coming across these stories about roads and how corrupt he was and we we kind of realized you know well there, there's a book in this and we should um, maybe dig a little bit deeper and and find out i mean we assumed that there would be a lot of corruption in colonialism and we knew that there was a lot of corruption during apartheid so then it just was a matter of kind of digging around and finding the stories we wanted to show that our current environment comes from a, a long history of this. It's embedded within many of our systems and the way that we do things and our laws have always been compromised by corruption and that this is just another manifestation of, of, of a problem that's inherent within our history and our society. Talking about the history of our society, in the book you start off by informing the readers about people like Susan John Rhodes and Paul Kruger. Would you mind sharing a bit of how both of these characters were able to use corrupt deals in, in how they were leaders at the time? So Rhodes is a fascinating character for a lot of reasons. One of them is because his history has been so badly told in South Africa. You know, there are a whole lot of ideas about who Rhodes was and what he did, which are completely inaccurate. You know, that he was this imperialist who put money towards these good causes of education and all. That's just palpably untrue. You know, Rhodes arrived in South Africa and he was involved in bribery and corruption right from the beginning. I mean, there's a story that we tell about how he bribed a guy in Kimberley to basically destroy the water pumps at the mines so that he could essentially gain the contract. Um, and I mean, that's a, a well-told story in, in many books. Um, but for some reason, people, and I think to be quite honest, it's just because in South Africa, we revere money. So if somebody's got a lot of money, we just kind of forget that actually how they got the money is deeply, you know, has compromised them and the people around them. And essentially, you know, Rhodes put his money to his own uses and he was in many ways obsessed with power. He's a strange character in that he wasn't really obsessed with, with money in itself. He, he you know, he, he was led quite as kind of austere life, even though he built Krutuskir and, you know, the, his house, it, it wasn't particularly lavishly decorated or anything. It was relatively austere, but he was interested in how money could, you know, empower him. But he bribed people and he bribed an entire political party at one point, um, the, the Bond. But he was just involved in many, many corrupt acts. And one of the acts that he was involved in was, you know, he wasn't shy of going to war over, um, over issues of money. You know, if he wanted to rid for example, what was then Matabili land of the control that Lobangula had over, over the land there, he just, you know, got his, his man Jamison to go and, you know, start an absolutely ridiculous war that had no legitimacy. Um, and then he tried to, of course, invade Kruger's 
Transvaal, or the ZAR, as it was called. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, he was just an inherently corrupt person who was also morally corrupt, and that he had no qualms over invading, murdering, and in his minds, even the human rights violations within the, that practice were, were extreme. But anyway, I talked about him invading the Kruger ZAR, so maybe, maybe we can go um, segue into Kruger. So Nick, would you mind sharing a bit on how Paul Kruger managed to also get himself involved in, 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 in corrupt dealings? So Kruger, you know, he was in the same era as Rhodes, but quite different characters. Kruger, I didn't get the feeling that he was that into money himself. Um, and he wasn't even that corrupt. But he presided over a system that was incredibly corrupt. And, and there's some reasons for this. Basically, in 1881, the, the ZAR, after a series of battles against the British, got their independence for the second time. They had first become independent in the 1850s. So they were independent from Britain and they had their own country, but they had very little else. They had no money and no economy to speak of. They just had this land, the Transvaal. And Kruger was, he was actually one of three leaders at the, at the very beginning. They had a triumvirate and they needed to grow their economy. And the, a Jewish Hungarian guy called Hugo Nelmapius came up with the idea. He actually wrote a letter to Kruger saying, I can see your country needs to grow and I've got an idea. If you give me the sole right to manufacture alcohol and sugar, I'll give you a thousand pounds a year. And Kruger said, that's great. Go ahead. Like, give me the thousand pounds. And he said, um, I'll give you the monopoly for alcohol and sugar. And Nelmatias went ahead and set this thing up and it, it was pretty corrupt the factory, but it was small scale. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to really make or break anything. This petty corruption with his monopolies policy. Everything changed enormously in 1886 when gold was discovered on the Vizvatis front. And it went from being like this economic backwater to one of the financial hubs of the world. And Kruger, this is where he made his big error. He, he didn't say the monopoly, the concessions policy was okay when we were a small country, but now we must move on to something a bit more progressive. He clung to it and he said, no, it worked then and it's going to work now. And suddenly that you had these people getting concessions to manufacture things like dynamite or to construct railways. And um, the ZAR was getting through something like 6 million cases of dynamite in a year. So it was a massive Thing. And one guy was given the monopoly to manufacture dynamite. Now, of course, the rule of this whole monopoly policy was that it had to be manufactured on ZAR soil. That was the point, to grow the economy. But the guy who got the concession didn't have the capabilities to actually manufacture dynamite. So he started importing dynamite from France and putting a label on the box that said it was made in South Africa. Uh, and making an absolute fortune in the process. So um, this actually got discovered. People, there were rumors going around. And in, a, in one of the more memorable episodes in the book, during a, a parliamentary tea time, they gathered in the main square in Pretoria to test whether the stuff that he was importing was actually dynamite. And obviously it was, and there was a massive explosion and the point was proven. And I mean, this, this corruption, just the whole government ran on corruption. So people were being given gifts left, right and center. And, and the, what the gifts were is quite fun. Like it was like gold pocket watches and fast carriage, horse-drawn carriages called spiders. And like, you know, there were often situations where every single member of the, or like, 25 of the 30 members of parliament had been on record as receiving gifts to approve a certain thing. So yeah, it was, um, it was quite a unique corruption, but it's, I mean, the, the relationship between Kruger and these businessmen, tenderpreneurs, who were known as the third Volksrat. So there was a first Volksrat, which was like the Senate, a second Volksrat, which is the House of Representatives. 
and a third fork throughout, which was his friendships with tenderpreneurs, where we're actually remarkably similar to those in, in the Gupta years. Matthew, our country recently celebrated 25 years of the Constitution. Will this book now give us an insight on how apartheid leaders manipulated the system to work in their favor? Um, well, certainly in, in 1910, there was a constitution of South Africa. It was called the South Africa Act, which essentially acted like a constitution. Um, and the apartheid government did their absolute level best to undermine that constitution. And again, you know, this is, this is a relevant issue to our own lives at the moment is, you know, how politicians can undermine our constitution. It's something that we, again, you know, we've seen regularly in our history. And one, one of the instances was, I mean, it wasn't a particularly generous constitution, and it certainly didn't have notions of human rights and and all of the things that our you know our constitution has now but it nevertheless had clauses like a, a two-thirds majority clause on on various um, issues which slowly the apartheid government eroded and changed laws and manipulated itself so you know in that way we have a very good example of how a constitution can be undermined in the apartheid government. And, you know, this is something that we should regularly look at for our own constitution at the moment is, you know, what are the worries and concerns over our constitution? What have we seen before? And when issues are being undermined, there is, there's a good example of it in the apartheid era. So when you speak about the, the brooded bond, I was shocked uh, at how the group managed to capture the country's economy. Can you briefly tell us how this group was formed and how the state was captured during those days? Yeah, I mean, the brooded bond is a, a really interesting piece of South African history. Um, and I mean, its, its inception really begins as a reaction to the English-speaking control of the South African economy. Um, and yeah. they form in, in 1918 as a sort of cultural movement to essentially address how can the Afrikaans people uplift themselves. It's a sort of Afrikaans upliftment movement. And its main enemy is the English speaking monopoly capital. Um, and obviously one, one has heard that, that word around. So they formed, in the 1930s, they became very persuaded and very interested in Nazi ideology. And many of them actually went over to Nazi Germany and studied there. And the decision, essentially, a, a guy called Nico Diedrichs and a few other people around like Pete Mayer and, and obviously a guy called HF Favut, realized that the way that you could capture South Africa was through the economy more than through politics. And they began essentially a kind of program of economic capture more than political capture. And they set up organizations and banks and, and you know, they slowly began to, to, to make their way into the South African economy. Um, and then, obviously, you, you know, there was this 1948 event, which they were part of. They were always part of the National Party, and, the, and, and even Milan was a member of the Brudebond, but not a, a, a leading member of the Brudebond. They were an inherent part of the National Party, but they ca essentially, by about 1958, they'd kind of captured the National Party. And, and th through that, they began a kind of full-scale economic capture of the entire country and they did things like hand out coal tenders for ESCOM to their friends so you know again we see this the same the repetition of you know just just the zuma years and there's a subtle irony that they handed it over to brothers uh, the Bruderbond, um, while Zuma handed it over to a couple of brothers called the Guptas. Um, you know, so um, there is this, this repetition, but they were a secret organization as well. They never came out in public as a force. And, and the way that they captured the economy and, and essentially the politics in the end was, was quite, you know, underhanded. It wasn't, it wasn't open, it wasn't legal. 
it was all done through through very similar methods to the ones that Zuma used. So the similarities on how the state was captured during that time, with, for example, now the so-called nine wasted years, which we witnessed in the Zuta era. I, th I think the, the comparison, you know, one of the things people often say to defend apartheid is that during the Zuma years, things fell apart. They didn't run a country correctly. You know, like basic services fell by the wayside. And people often say, but during apartheid, they, you know, they may have been corrupt, but they knew how to run a country. The roads didn't have potholes and, and people had running water. And I think what people really forget is that that's true if you were white. But if you were black, you weren't getting anything. You were actually far worse off. So you didn't have a running water, you didn't have electricity, you had a substandard education system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, you talk about nine wasted years during the Zuma administration, but 1948 to 1994 were, were pretty wasted years for a huge segment of our population. So, yeah, it's, it's a good comparison. The other thing that people forget is that the economy wasn't always wonderful during apartheid. From the mid 70s onwards, they were hitting the skids a bit. So people often misremember and think, oh, back in the day, it was so much better. I am talking here from sort of disgruntled white people's perspective. And uh, yeah, it, it just goes to show that reading history is, and knowing your history is always a good thing because it'll, more often than not, it will surprise you. Like you, you won't, you'll think it was one way, but actually it's, it's often more interesting and more nuanced than you think. And reading a book, Nick, do you think now that with the information that you've shared with us, especially uh, coming back from the, the, all the leaders like Paul Crew, Cassis and John, John Rhodes, and now the leaders that we have now, do you think that the upcoming leaders, if they were to read this book, maybe can turn back the times and then, be better leaders than what we've seen before. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we'd love future leaders to read the book just to partially know that, you know, that there's a long history of this. So they, they mustn't just feel angry at those who've just come before them, you know, so, so they can realize that, that there are reasons that this is happening. Um, but I, th I think it would be good to read the book also just to, to get a perspective on because throughout the book, there are people who did the right thing. And, and you could always take a cue from that. So like they could learn things like the importance of keeping the judiciary in a good state. Because when, in many cases, judges played a role in exposing corruption. And, and when there's been a strong judiciary, it's been a good thing. The free press is another thing, you know, so it's, it's tempting to control the press and to, to have newspapers only write good things about you. But I think in, in a way, you're going to be better off if you allow the press to do its work. If, if you've got good intentions, that is. If you've got bad intentions, you, you, you want to capture the press as soon as possible. But, but the role of the judi judiciary and the, the free press, I think, can't be underestimated. And I think just reading the book, discovering that it's been happening for 350 years, would, would definitely be a good thing for future leaders, yeah. What else will the readers get if they were to get this book? They will hopefully be entertained because some of the stories <laughs> are like quite unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, you'll also, and, and this is something that sort of happened while we were writing the book, we realized mm. we're covering a long period of our history and we should fill in the gaps for readers. So it's not just about corruption. Like you do get a fairly good sort of sense of our history from the Dutch East India Company through British occupation. Looking at the ZAR, there's a bit of the Boer War, um, apartheid, the homelands. You know, the, the homelands are another section that get, get a couple of quite interesting chapters. And then also kind of interesting how apartheid corruption sort of Slide, slid into post-94 corruption. Like, it's interesting that things like the arms deal wasn't an ANC-only creation. Many of the contacts were created during apartheid. So 
so there's that. And then there are also quite a lot of sidebars and primary, we, we quoted a lot from the people themselves during the time. So we, we didn't want to like tell the story for them. We wanted to show that throughout our history, there have been people who've been hell bent on doing the absolute worst for our country. But at the same time, there have been people who've been hell bent on exposing this. And there's some really fabulous characters in our history, good people who stood up for the right thing and risked their lives for it, or at least their reputation. And, and mm -hmm. like, I think you, someone said to me that it's the first book they've read on corruption that didn't leave them feeling depressed. And, and I think that would be something we'd like to achieve. Mm -hmm. We, that's what, how we'd yes. like people to feel at the end of the book. That was Matthew and Nick in conversation with Polity about their book titled Rogues Gallery, an irreverent history of corruption in South Africa from the VOC to the ANC.